Welcome back to 100 Plus, a study of the most important people, events, and ideas that shaped the Christian faith over the last 2,000 years. Today we transition from late antiquity into the early Middle Ages with a massively important figure, St. Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo. It is hard to overstate Augustine's importance. Some believe that outside of the Bible, he is the most influential Christian of all time. Today, on episode 11, Mike will be looking at Augustine's life and influence. Today we take a look at a giant of the past, a figure claimed by both Protestants and Catholics alike. Uh, If you've been following along, you know that earlier we considered some of the prominent church fathers from the anti-Nicene period. Uh, That is the 200 plus years between the death of John the Baptist, uh, around 100 AD, and the start of the Council of Nicaea. So this is uh, after the apostolic period and before this uh, significant first church ecumenical council. Uh, In that anti-Nicene period, I did uh, a a program on Justin Martyr, uh, an early apologist. I did a program on Polycarp, and then I did one uh, podcast on a handful of other anti-Nicene leaders, Origen, Irenaeus, Tertullian, and a few others. We then looked at Constantine and the Council of Nicaea itself, took a a little detour to talk about the um, Apostles' Creed, which was uh, started before that time, but it doesn't get completed until much later. And then last week, uh, the last podcast, we looked at um, uh, Athanasius, uh, who's the first sort of post-Nicene uh, leader. I also commented on uh, the Cappadocian fathers uh, as well. So um, these are all a few of the people who get recognized as doctors of the church. This is a Roman Catholic designation for those whose writings are considered um, spot on. The, the uh, doctor of the church is not as high as, for instance, the Pope, so their writings don't carry the weight of so, some sort of papal decree. But they're recognized as being very significant players. And I'll just remind you, when we talk about the Catholic Church at this point, the Catholic means universal, and there is no other church. So the Roman Catholic Church comes about later. Uh, there's a first split between the East and the West, between the Western Church or the Catholic Church and the Eastern or the Orthodox, capital O Church, that comes in the 11th century. And then the Western Church will split uh, with Luther in the 1500s, Uh, between the Protestants, the protesters who are arguing that the uh, Catholic universal Western church is making some mistakes, has gone down the wrong path. Um, But anyway, Augustine is um, going to be part of the post-Nicene group of church fathers. This includes, again, Athanasius, the Cappadocian fathers. Uh, It also includes a few others, Ambrose and Jerome. The biggest is Augustine. And today we are looking at him. He is the most important figure we have considered to date. Some would say he's one of the very most important people outside of the Bible ever. He is, uh, he is a post-Nicene father. He's a doctor of the church. He's a philosopher. He's a writer. He's a pastor. He's a bishop. Uh, he's somebody who actually sort of bridges the gap between the post-Nicene period or the period of antiquity and the Middle Ages, which we're going to be moving into. So Augustine's importance is hard to overstate. Uh, As a writer, he writes confessions, which is an entirely new genre of literature. Today, people often write books and bear their souls and talk about their struggles and their ups and downs and all that. Before Augustine did it with confessions, nobody wrote a book like that. So if you had books, not many people were writing them, but if you had a king writing, he was writing about how great he was and how noble he was and how he won all these battles. He wasn't talking about his inner fears or anything like that. So he changes writing in a profound way. Theologically, he writes about grace, he writes about works, he writes about justification. uh, And it's largely true to say everybody who writes after Augustine is in some way responding to Augustine, whether they know it or not. Uh, As a pastor, his thinking and his writing is going to lead and shape the church. It's going to reposition the church as it leaves the uh, antiquity period and heads into Middle Ages. In in the prior to uh, Constantine, again, the church tends to be 
very exclusive. It has a high demand. Being a Christian could cost you your life. So there's not a lot of uh, nominal Christ followers at that point. It's going to be much broader now. The government's getting involved. And Augustine is going to be writing about all this. He writes about the sacraments. He's going to write about church ministry. Uh, and his writings are important. And then he's going to write on ethics and culture. And what he says there, we're still talking about it. He's the guy who gives us uh, just war theory. He's the first one that talks about a Christian being able to be somebody who's going to be in the military. So in so many ways, we uh, as Christians and we as Westerners are shaped by Augustine. So before um, I uh, talk about what he wrote, let me give you a little bit of a backdrop of his life. And there's a whole lot that could be said about his life because we know more about Augustine than we know about just about anyone else until this time. Because we have two big sources. One, we have the Confessions, which is his uh, autobiography. It's more than that. It's a spiritual reflection. He doesn't write until he's 47. He's a bishop then. He's writing a, a different kind of book. But it is autobiographical. It follows him up to the age of 35. Uh, we also have um, uh, a book written by his biographer, a, a bishop who lived nearby, Posidius. And so uh, we just have a lot about Augustine that we can talk about. So he is born uh, November 13, 354, in the North African coastal town of uh, Thagaste. And uh, this is in what is now modern-day Algeria. Uh, it was part of the Roman Empire at the time, but it's sort of backwater. Uh, his father, Patricius, or uh, Patrick as it's anglicized, uh, his father is a mid-level civil servant and a pagan. Uh, not a diehard pagan, uh, and it looks like he becomes a Christ follower at the time of his conversion, or excuse me, <laughs> well, that makes sense. He becomes a Christ follower uh, on his deathbed. But he's not that significant. He's, uh, the, the person that shapes Augustine is his mother, Monica, who is the, uh, just a zealous, uh, mother. She's the original helicopter mom. She is, uh, she is going to pray her son into the kingdom. Uh, she will later be made a saint uh, on her own right. Uh, Ryan Reeves, a church historian of Gordon Conwell, uh, calls Monica a firebrand and one of the best mothers in the church in history. He says she literally chased down uh, Augustine for Jesus and prays him into conversion. So as a child, Augustine is, uh, it's note, noted that he's very bright, he's very ambitious, he's very well spoken. And so his parents, who have modest means, save in order to get him a great education. He's the only one of his siblings who is going to have this opportunity. And Augustine will be in and out of school as his parents are able to make tuition payments. Um, when he's 16, he goes off to Carthage to go to the university there. Uh, this is uh, the largest city in the region. Carthage is a good school. It's not a top flight school. It sort of leans in that direction. There, it's the only place he can sort of go. And he studies rhetoric, which we don't much understand today. There's no real equivalent. It's a combination of, of literature and poetry and, and speech and persuasion. And it's sort of the, the thing you study if you want to go to the upper echelons of Roman society. So he is reaching to go as high as he possibly can. Not long after he arrives in Carthage, his father dies, and he gives up any faith, this would have been his mother's faith, any Christian faith that he was still holding on to. He abandons Christianity because it's not intellectual enough for him, and because, in his words, he did not have the strength uh, to seek God after dipping into, quote, hell's black river of lust. Uh, along those lines, he takes a concubine with whom he will uh, father a child and whom he appears to love. Uh, now, a concubine is not a prostitute. Uh, it's sort of a common law wife, but it is, a, it is a marriage without any legal standing. So uh, he appears to love her. They're together for 15 years. Uh, he'll write quite openly about how taken he is with sex in general and with her in particular. This is a man who will pray, asking God for the gift of celibacy, but, quote, not yet. Um, so you need to know that Augustine grew up in uh, North Africa. And North Africa at the time was a bit like the Bible Belt today. 
So it had a very muscular Christianity. As a matter of fact, that one of the big challenges there is you've got the Donatists who will come up later on. And the Donatists are those who uh, sort of fall outside the bounds of Christianity because they're, they're a little bit too moralistic, a little bit too works righteous. And they're the ones, uh, I mentioned them earlier, that initially there's the, these uh, scandals in the church where people renounce Christ in order to uh, not suffer under, you know, in, under one of the Roman emperors who's demanding that they renounce Christ and worship a Roman god. Even some clergy will uh, renounce Christ. Well, then later on, these people want back into the church. And the Donatists are those that say, uh, no can do. Uh, you're not allowed. And as a matter of fact, there's a big controversy that follows them because they will say that uh, it's particularly important that you know that, that your pastor, your priest, uh, not only didn't renounce Christ, but, but was never officially uh, associated or, or, or uh, endorsed by somebody who did. Because your salvation depends very much on the holiness of your pastor and his ability to uh, offer the sacraments depend your ability to get the sacraments depends upon his ability to be holy to give them to you and so this is a big controversy and um, and so uh, he is coming out of this rigid bible belt and he rejects it he 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 moves away but he's going to carry some he's going to carry some bible belt guilt with him especially as he goes to the big city and and uh, you know, uh, starts to live a wild life, has, has, a, uh, has a, a concubine, and uh, is, um, well, yes, all of that. So he's a bit of a prodigal in his own mind, um, and his, both his intellect and his carnal delights make it hard for him to continue to follow God. So during his time in Carthage, um, Another thing that's very important will happen, he will read Cicero and he will become a philosopher. Now, he's just sort of a philosopher generally. He's, he's doggedly in pursuit of truth, and this is going to lead him down several paths. Initially, he becomes a Manichaeist, and um, Manichaeism is sort of, a, sort of a, a religion that blends some Buddhism and before Buddhism and some Jesus and some Zoroastrianism and some Manny was a leader and it sort of puts it together with a harsh dualism uh, believe the belief that there's a eternal gods one's good and one's bad and, and so evil is sort of located outside of you it's very popular for uh, young people to embrace sort of like uh, Socialism was popular in the 1920s and again in the 1970s uh, among all college freshmen, and, and they embraced it to sort of hack off their parents. So he becomes a Manichaeist, and uh, he's going to be in this movement for 10 years. Uh, in 375, he will finish his study of rhetoric, and he will open a uh, shop. He'll hang a shingle, and, and will be offering to tutor people in rhetoric. Uh, he does this in Carthage, and he teaches there for eight or nine years before he decides to try his hand in the big city of Rome. So he's chasing the bright lights. Uh, he opens a school of rhetoric there. He does not have any fun. Uh, he doesn't like Rome for various reasons, but he has a chance meeting with uh, the governor of Rome. So obviously, uh, Augustine is a very up-and-coming person, and so the governor of Rome takes note of him. Uh, Symmachus, and he tells Augustine that there is a very elite position for uh, a professor of rhetoric in Milan, uh, the imperial city. And so Augustine applies for it and wins it. Uh, this is the top post, uh, prestigious post at a prestigious university in the, a prestigious city. He's going to be hanging out with politicians. He's going to be moving among the elite. He wins this post at the age of 30. However, he's not happy. He's reached the top of the game, and uh, he's not happy. So it's during this time that he is going to leave Manichaeism and briefly dabble in Neoplatonism. Uh, it still doesn't do it for him. And then he's going to hear the gospel. Now, Humanly speaking, there are a handful of things that are going to um, factor into his decision to trust Christ. Obviously, uh, 
humanly speaking, is a very small part of this equation, right? God is pulling him to himself. But first, he's searching. He's not happy. Uh, his professional career is flourishing, but he's not found that to be fulfilling. Uh, his life isn't working. Among other things, his mother, who has followed him to Milan, thank you, Mom, uh, the helicopter mom that she is, has decided that he needs a good marriage to a respectable woman. So he chases away his concubine of 15 years with whom he has this son, uh, who will also come to faith uh, and die shortly thereafter. But uh, he chases her away, chases her back to Africa, and he arranges a, a marriage with a, with a fashionable young woman. Well, a fashionable young girl. She's 10. Uh, so Augustine is broken over this. He's lost this woman that he, he cared for. And he's not inclined to wait until this 10-year-old is, uh, is able to be his wife. And so he takes another concubine. And this sort of distresses him that he has no control over his own carnal desires. He cannot control himself. Second, uh, he falls under the influence of Ambrose. So Ambrose is uh, the bishop in the area, and he, he's pastoring a church there in Milan. And everybody wants to go hear Ambrose because Ambrose is so eloquent. And so as a professor of rhetoric, uh, Augustine goes to hear Ambrose, sort of quite, quite interested in hearing this eloquent preacher. He's not interested, he says, in hearing about Christianity. He's dismissed that, but he will, he's going there to study rhetoric. Well, Ambrose uh, will, uh, he will persuade him. Now, it's interesting and I think important for uh, people like me to hear that uh, Augustine will, many will say that Ambrose sort of wins him over by the power of his speech and his rhetoric and his arguments and all that. Ambrose will say, no, um, he became my friend. And he, it wasn't as a preacher as much as it was as a pastor that, uh, that Augustine will be influenced by Ambrose. But uh, he goes to study his style, he hears the gospel, and he's moved. And then, then the story is told in Confessions, and it's sort of famous, that uh, one day he's sitting in a garden, and he's uh, pondering life, and he's reading this uh, Antony, uh, who will come up in a future, um, in a future podcast. Anthony's a monk. So he's reading the writings of this monk. So here he is. <laughs> he's this elite professor of rhetoric in this elite imperial city, but he's not happy. He's reading the writings of a monk. He can't, he's saying, I can't control myself. He's taken by those who have some ability to control themselves. Uh, he's weeping, he's empty, and he hears a child's voice say, tole lege, tole lege, take up and read. So he doesn't know, and he will say, whether it was a young boy or a young girl or whether it was a voice of heaven. But he looks, and he has a Bible there. So he takes the Bible, he opens it up in a manner of Bible study that pastors cringe hearing about all the time, opens it up, randomly points his finger to a text, and it's Romans 13, 13, which is uh, calling on him to give up this life of drunkenness and orgies uh, and to yield to the Spirit of God. So uh, it's quite an interesting passage uh, for a guy who's going to be known as uh, the doctor of grace to hear something that can feel like it's a little bit legalistic. But uh, there's more to this passage in Romans if you actually study it uh, that's been going on here. And, and very possibly Augustine knew that or he studies it, but he is going to be converted at this point. So he's 31 years old, the year 386. Uh, a year later, Ambrose will baptize him and then in 389, he and his mom will begin the trek back to uh, North Africa. And uh, he, wants the, uh, he wants a quiet life. He wants to get out of the spotlight. He wants to, to just be uh, a simple person living uh, in sort of a quiet community. While they are traveling back to North Africa, Monica dies. She is, she, she is happy. Her son has come to faith in Christ, and he's been baptized, and she, she's, she's, she's happy about that. She passes away. Um, so I'm going to focus on, on his writings um, in a second. You need to know that once he gets back there in 389, his talents are such that he cannot remain under the radar. People 
uh, people are drawn to him. And in uh, in a couple years later, while he is visiting this uh, town of Hippo, which is uh, 60 miles away, uh, he speaks, and the people there, the church there, uh, prevail upon him. And with weeping, he agrees to give up the quiet monastic life that he had been hoping for. And in 91, he agrees to stay there. He enters the priesthood. And then uh, a few years later, he will be made the bishop of the area. He'll be 35 at the time, and he will continue in that spot for, for the next 40 years. So uh, again, I want to talk about his writings. You need to understand that he's living at this interesting moment. So he's living at the time that the Roman Empire, the mighty, um, powerful Roman Empire that's been going for hundreds and hundreds of years, and Rome is the is the, the center of the world, and Rome is the center of civilization, and all this is happening. Rome is collapsing. Uh, the, the barbarians are at the gate, and this is going to, uh, so he's living in a time of, of political, global instability. Uh, he is also living between the Council of Nicaea, Constantinople, uh, which is where Athanasius sort of gets the, uh, you know, gets it, the, the Pelagians and the semi-Pelagians beaten back, so the second big council. He's living between that and, the, and a council called Ephesus I. So this is all before Chalcedon, uh, which we're going to look at in a little bit. But um, so th that means that the, many of the bigger issues of the, of the Christian faith have sort of been hammered out and agreed upon but not all of them. And so there's a lot of discussion going on about salvation and the nature of humanity and the, the nature of, of Christ's work, and he will be involved in this. As a matter of fact, as a writer, uh, he's going to be involved in all the issues uh, during his life. So he will publish uh, 500 sermons, uh, 250 letters or treatises on all kinds of topics. Uh, but the, the, the big things he's going to be known for, first of all, as I mentioned, is the book, of, uh, is the book called Confessions. There, there had been nothing like it at the time uh, that it showed up. Uh, there have been biographies, but not with this kind of introspection and doubt. Uh, today, if you read it, and you should, but today if you read it, it's a little bit ho-hum because we have scandalous tell-all kinds of books. Uh, at the time, this was a bit scandalous, and it's just, just he was very open. Now, he's writing as a bishop. So you got to understand, this is not just a tell-all. This isn't, you know, you're not reading uh, People magazine or something. Uh, it's, not, it's nothing like that. Uh, it's a, it's a, a prayer. It's a reflection on his life. Uh, it opens with the famous line, well, in the First paragraph, our hearts are restless. Oh God, thou hast made us for, thine, for thyself. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. And, uh, but he's going he's gonna to share about his life and about his brokenness. He's writing as a bishop, as a very prominent person. He's 47, and he's writing about his conversion. And uh, he'll write a famous passage about stealing pears, uh, in which he's quite taken by the fact that as a boy, one of his first memories, as a boy, he went with other boys to steal pears from this farmer. And he wasn't even hungry. He says, I'm just, I was just drawn to <laughs> evil. I wanted to do it because it was wrong. Uh, so he'll reflect on his brokenness. Now, you can read into that a lot more, and some people will, right? He, he sort of recreates the garden scene. It's a pear, not an apple, and it's sin. He can't resist it, right? There's a, there's a, whole, lot, uh, there's a whole lot of parallels there. There may be more going on, but... But uh, big work is confessions. Uh, another big work that he'll do is writing against the Donatists. So I've already mentioned them. They were this you know, uh, legalistic group. And, uh, and Augustine, when someone says to you they're, uh, they're Augustinian in their thought, it means principally they have a big view of God and God's sovereignty and God's providence. And they have a, a, a very humble view of themselves. They're very broken, sinful, fallen, dependent upon God for everything. And so, uh, of course, Augustine reacts against this idea that there are these wonderful priests, uh, pastors, who are, who are holy and spiritual and have got everything buttoned up and that, that it's possible to be um, you know, a perfect person. This is, Augustine is going to say, not a chance. 
not a chance. And so he will write, and uh, because of his writings, he's going to get the Donatists, he'll be part of getting the Donatists um, pushed out of the, any sort of Christian uh, fold. They'll be voted out. Uh, the Roman government is actually going to ban them in 405. Uh, he will also write City of God. So, um, so as I said, Rome is falling. And Rome is, uh, the fact that Rome is falling, uh, many will blame on Christians. So the Christian faith is spreading uh, throughout the Roman Empire. Many, many people in the last hundred years since the Edict of Milan have been is has been issued, many people are coming to faith. And, uh, and the, the classic Roman who has this pantheon of Roman gods and believes that we should all be worshiping Caesar and all these Roman gods thinks, well, the reason we're falling is because the Roman gods are mad. And Christians are to blame. And Christians are bad for Rome. And Christians are bad citizens. And uh, so uh, Augustine will write and, and will say, no, that's not it at all. Um, so Christians are actually very good citizens. And Christians have uh, two citizenships. They're, ci they're ultimately citizens of the city of God. And this is the lasting city, Jerusalem. And it's, it's the eternal city. That's what's really real. And the city of man is not unimportant, and we need to be good citizens, but uh, we've got to understand this joint citizenship. Uh, he will write, he will write uh, against Pelagius. Some would say this, this is his most important work. So um, just as this guy Arius had come up and challenged the idea of the deity of Christ, saying that Jesus is you know, the vice president of heaven, but not equal to God, not fully God, uh, Pelagius is a Brit, and he comes down from um, when, when the Roman Empire is crumbling, he flees Rome and he comes to North Africa. And he goes to Hippo and he hears um, Augustine preach. And he's horrified because he sees a lot of laxity in the church, uh, and he believes that uh, through uh, discipline and spiritual practices and rigor and self-denial, and uh, monastic living and all these things, that it's possible for a Christian to be perfect. He denies original sin. He doesn't see Jesus as a savior. He sees Jesus as a great example. And so uh, he will go after Augustine. And Augustine <laughs> will then go after him. And so they'll have a little, uh, a little dust up. And Augustine, of course, uh, will prevail. You didn't really want to fight Augustine. Sort of like going against Mike Tyson in his prime. Like it's not going to end well. And I'm not going to say you're going to get your ear bit off, but uh, you didn't want to go up against Augustine. And, uh, and so uh, po the Pelagians and then the semi-Pelagians are going to be put down uh, by the church. Or by, yes, by Augustine and by others. So this is not all he wrote. He wrote uh, on, again, he wrote on ethics. He wrote on culture. He wrote uh, more theological works. He wrote on the Trinity. So generally, in the eastern half of the church, so Orthodox church, again, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, the, the uh, Greek-speaking side of the church after the Great Schism in the 11th century, they will see the Trinity. They'll start with the idea of three gods in one, or three, excuse me, that would be heresy, three persons in one god. The western half of the church, uh, so again, this is called Catholic initially before, it's all Catholic before it splits, the universal church, but, but the western half of the church will, uh, because of Augustine's writings, see God more, one God in three persons. So the east sort of says three persons in one God, the, the west sees one God in three persons. He's shaping that, he, he will write on the sacraments, um, and uh, yeah, he will, he will have lots of, there's lots of, lots of ways you have heard of Augustine or heard from Augustine, even if you don't know it. So wrapping things up, in 429, so in 410 is when the barbarians were at the gate. That's when uh, the first breach of the Roman wall, quote unquote, happened. Rome, uh, Rome as it had grown lax, had uh, sort of outsourced their security to these Barbarians, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Vandals, all these tribes that are running around in uh, northern Germany and other places. Sort of like the Rolling Stones, you know, uh, contracting with Hell's Angels for security. It, it turned out not to be a good idea in the end.
because you've got the, your security starting a lot of the fights. And at some point, uh, in, at some point in 410, Alaric the Hun is going to be the first one to sort of breach and turn on Rome and loot Rome. Uh, well, in, in 429, the, the Vandal invasion has spread into uh, North Africa. And as Augustine lay dying, uh, he's got malaria, um, and Pisidius, his, uh, his biographer, is going to say that he spent his last days studying the penitential psalms, confessing his sin, weeping, uh, praying to God. Uh, he didn't want anyone to visit him. He didn't want anyone to interrupt his time of prayer with God. Um, but while he lays dying, the vandals will, uh, will come into Hippo. They leave him alone. They leave alone some of the work that he did. They, you know, they, they pillage, they burn, they, they rape, they, they do a lot of bad things, but there's a little bit of reverence that, that even the vandals showed for Augustine. And then he will die August 28th, 430 at the age of 75. So let me say, we owe a lot to Augustine, uh, especially some clarity and focus on grace. And um, if you want to read just one thing of his, probably Confessions is where you go. City of God would um, maybe be the second place to go. Uh, and a lot of people are reading City of God now because, of course, they're making drawing parallels between Rome and the fall of Rome and all that's going on uh, in the West and in the United States right now. Well, um, thanks for joining today. The next podcast, we're going to be looking at the epic figure of Jerome.